<clears throat> All right. So, hi, uh, I'm Marika Mahmutova, and today I'm going to present a project that I've been working on as part of my master's thesis uh, at EPFL in collaboration with Evidation Health. So, in this work, we predict, predict the self reported depression scores using person generated health data from a virtual one year mental health observation study. First of all, I'm going to give you a background on depression. So, depression is a leading cause of disability worldwide that is often underdiagnosed for reasons including stigma surrounding mental health, limited access to healthcare, or financial barriers. Um, and in 2017, 17.3 million adults in the US experienced at least one major depressive episode in the last year, without 35% of them not having received any treatment. And untreated depression worsens the quality of life and it has a very high economic burden with uh, an economic burden of over 200 billion US dollars annually, uh, just in the US. Thus, it's important to make the detection and the monitoring of depression symptoms easier and more affordable to the general population. This can be done with the help of person-generated health data, which is often abbreviated as PGHD. Multiple studies have shown that PGHD can provide an early indicator of changes in mental health by social media use or physical activity patterns. So consumer wearable technologies, such as Fitbits, for example, they provide PGHD. Uh, more specifically, they provide activity data at a minute level granularity, which can be used to detect depressive behaviors, which is a prime example of a non-invasive low burden treatment, uh, low burden method for depression diagnosis. And employing a low burden uh, data collection method can produce a large amount of data, but it'll be sparse data. So we had to account for this in our work. So the goal of our work was to predict depression severity using PGHD. Here we got PGHD in the form of self-reported survey responses, as well as consumer wearable data. And we measured de depression severity using PHQ-9, the patient health questionnaire 9, which is a nine item questionnaire, which is proven to be reliable and valid to measure depression severity. And it has five levels of depression severity, making this a multi-label classification problem. As far as we know, this is the first work that is um, trying to classify depression severity as a multi-label problem, and not only distinguishing between healthy controls and depressed individuals. So here I'm going to share the data collection timeline. The data used uh, in this project are part of the Discover project developed by Evidation Health. This is a year long longitudinal study consisting of 10,036 individuals where the participants completed regular surveys about their mental health and lifestyle changes. So we can see here, the participants completed the PHQ-9 to measure their mental health status once every quarter. So we were able to collect the quarterly data for our project as training and testing data, as we had the reference labels for PHQ-9. As well as the, we had a uh, monthly LMC surveys, which are the lifestyle and medical changes surveys. Um, for instance, uh, asking whether a participant has started a new medication or reduced alcohol consumption um, or changed their eating habits in some way. Also, throughout the study, the participants were asked to wear uh, their consumer wearables throughout the entire year. So the, what we, from this, we collected wearable PGHD in the form of sleep, step, and heart rate data at minute level granularity. And in this work, we analyzed day level and week level aggregate features, for instance, day level step count. Um, also, because PHQ-9 scores summarize depression severity over the last two weeks, we only consider the wearable data over this time frame. So in the 14 days prior to PHQ-9 completion for each quarter. So the final goal with this work would be to generate more frequent intermediate PHQ-9 labels. So like for months one and two here, which will be used in combination with reference labels to reduce the sparsity of our data set. So, in order to uh, create our classification model, we needed to create data samples. So again, we generate one data sample per quarter. And one data sample consists of one observation of PHQ-9, one set of screener survey responses uh, completed at baseline, one set of lifestyle medical changes survey responses, and uh, dense wearable PGHD. So 
we have generated at least one uh, data sample per quarter for a participant. And after an initial analysis, we have observed no difference in PHQ-9 scores across the various quarters. So for participants that were able to generate multiple samples, thus samples per different quarter, we considered each of these participants as independent every quarter because there was no difference um, across various um, demographic groups that we have observed. Thus, we have obtained uh, almost 11,000 samples from 4,036 unique participants. So a bit more about the data set statistics. We have all of the participants in the DISCOVER study with um, the mean age being 37.2 years old and the population comprising primarily of female uh, white participants. And the analyzed participants, as we can see, are good representative of the whole DISCOVER cohort with the average age being more or less the same at 37.4 uh, uh, years old, also majority female um, and white. So uh, we have kept the demographic distribution as the same. Also, um, I spoke to you at the start about the depression severity levels. So the PHQ-9 has five depression severity levels and from the samples that we've generated, um, again, almost 11,000 samples from our 4,000 participants, the majority of samples are, have, uh, the majority of participants have minimal to mild depression. And almost 30% of them have moderate to severe depression. So we have a slightly imbalanced data set. So the, let's discuss the methods. First of all, we start out with the feature processing and engineering, where we generate three groups of features. We have the static features from the screener survey responses, because we do not um, document any changes in these features throughout the study. Then, so we consider them a static. Then we have the LMC features generated from the lifestyle and medical changes survey responses, which are completed monthly. And then we also have the wearable PJHD features over the last, over a span of two weeks, uh, in which we compute trends, um, so statistical trends, changes, and we fit linear regression models on step and sleep data. Then we performed feature selection where we removed highly correlated features, and then we did recursive feature elimination and cross validated selection. And then we performed uh, our tests with uh, two classification algorithms with logistic regression being the baseline and extreme gradient boosting, XG boost um, being the best performing model, which constructs ensembles of decision trees, um, which also is good because that gives us a more interpretable model um, with hyperparameter tuning. Another reason why we chose XG boost is because as I mentioned uh, at the start, we have a large amount of uh, low burden data. This means, uh, I mean, low burden data collection means that we are provided with sparse data and ExtraBoost is able to handle missing data, uh, which is great for us because this means that we don't have to make assumptions about why participants didn't wear their wearables, uh, which could uh, inherently lead to many false assumptions. So if we're able to minimize this, uh, then that's great. So, because we have a classification model, we need a performance metric that allows us to optimize for our goal. Our goal is to predict as close as possible to the correct um, class because uh, we are in a numerical category problem. So the, uh, the primary metric that we chose is the quadratic weight of cones kappa, which is a metric that penalizes based on distance from the original category and allows us to optimize for adjacent accuracy, which is uh, one of our secondary per, uh, performance metrics, which measures the fraction of samples predicted at one at most one off from the target value. So for instance, if, it, if the category is supposed to be mild, but is predicted as moderate, that still counts in the adjacent accuracy. So actually this confusion matrix on the left here is based on one, uh, is, one is based on the best performing model results that we have. So, we can see that most participants are categorized as at most one off. And uh, we can see that this side of the triangle is a little bit heavier than this side. And this is because more participants are tend, uh, we tend to predict more participants as the milder categories, which is consistent because these are the categories that are overrepresented in the data set. So a little more about the results. Um, 
you can see that uh, here we have our two best performing models, one based solely on server responses from the static ones uh, based on social demographics and the LMC surveys. And then we have one with wearable PGHD, the best performing uh, results. So we can see that adding wearable PGHD improves model robustness on our primary uh, metric, performance metric, but there's a very, very small difference in average performance metrics that falls into the confidence intervals of each other. Um, but yes, so the confidence interval is uh, reduced for uh, the second model, which includes wearable PGHD. And we calculate the CI by averaging the best tuned models over five trained test splits um, that we have generated and tuned with the best hyperparameters. So we can see that here uh, I'm visualizing the most important features um, for our model, which again is one of the reasons why I've chosen XGBoost as it allows us to do this. Um, so the um, bars that are in green are static features. So generally social demographics and comorbidities. In blue, we have the wearable PGHD features and in orange, we have the lifestyle and medical changes features. So the yellow arrows point to features that are related to comorbidities. Which tend to be, which we can see are the most important features taken into account uh, to predict depression severity. And then here we see in red uh, two features that are related to money and having sufficient money or having received money assistance uh, that are very important in predicting depression severity again. And the uh, wearable PGHD features that we have added here and here, um, they are the number of days over the past week where a participant has taken at least 10,000 steps and the number of days where a participant has slept at least 10 hours. Oh, sorry. So of course there are some limitations. Um, one of the major limitations of our uh, problem is that we're dealing with self-reported data. So PHQ-9 scores and lifestyle medication changes are all self-reported and this can change honestly by the hour, uh, depending on how you feel or reporting changes in physical activity saying, yes, I have changed. These are all um, very relative uh, and biased features that uh, vary across the population. And uh, we also have a social demographic bias in the cohort population where the cohort comprises majorly of non-Hispanic white and female participants. Um, however, we have noticed that based on a uh, primary error analysis, there's no significant difference between model performance when comparing across various demographic attributes. So at least we have that as a good sign. So to summarize, we have been able to develop a multi-label classification model that predicts depression severity um, with uh, a decent ability to predict PHQ-9 score category and a very good ability to predict the adjacent category. We have found out that demographic attributes are crucial for evaluating depression severity. Um, and lifestyle changes and wearable PGHD attributes are not as important for model robustness, um, are important for model robustness, sorry, but not as important for predicting the absolute category. Um, more specifically, the number of recent active days and the number of recent hypersomnia days are the best wearable PGHD features for those from our experiments. And this is consistent with multiple studies investigating relationships between social demographics and depression and sleep and depression. Uh, it was honestly very surprising that changes and trends in wearable PGHD didn't improve model performance, but more of the threshold based features uh, improved our robustness. And so, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we're currently working on a publication regarding a two phase model where the work to present it today is the phase one model. So using the labels generated by the work presented uh, here, uh, which is the absolute depression severity, we'll be able to fill in these blanks in red, uh, which will be the intermediate labels to predict decline and depression, uh, allowing us to make inferences about the mental health status of participants without rendering the mental health questionnaires too frequent. So keeping them quarterly as opposed to rendering them monthly. 
and our model is starting to work, by the way. Uh, so thank you so much for listening to my presentation, and I'd like to thank the organizers of this workshop, as well as the co-authors and supervisors for this work, and everyone who's worked on this study. If you have any questions or comments, then feel free.